This video is entitled Units, Descendants, and Display and is a companion piece to the book So You Want to Learn to Use HTML and CSS, Chapter 6. I'm James Imrano, Ph.D., and I'll be taking you through this video presentation. In this video, we're going to cover common uh, cascading style sheet units or common units to measure things within style. We're going to be talking about the descendant combinator of how to select a selector's descendants. Um, we're going to talk about height and width styles, and we're going to talk about the display style. So uh, we've got a lot to cover in this one. There are lots of different ways in CSS to, to measure and to specify the size of things, but these are probably the five most common. Um, the, uh, the, the, two, the first two are absolute measurements. In other words, they describe an absolute amount of space on your screen. The PX pixel measurement, where you put a number in the letters PX in lowercase, uh, describe the little dots on the screen. Uh, that's problematic in some websites because uh, what if your screen is is 640 by 480 or somebody else's screen is 19 by what 1900 by whatever um, placing things or making things a specific size might not work for all browsers there's also an absolute measurement known as the point the PT um, in your word processing application you're familiar with it because when you drop down and choose a character's a letter's size that size 12 14 16 that represents points and a point is 172nd of an inch when it's printed that comes from the old days of of doing lead type and actual printing presses where they would take each letter on a little block of lead and stack them beside each other and then cover that in ink and use that to print 172nd of an inch was the thinnest foil made of lead that they could put in this space between letters so they could get things all tight on the printing press. So so that's a, that's a measurement that's hundreds of years old, but it's the point. And you've seen it and used it your whole life, maybe didn't even know what it was. The uh, next three measurements are measurements of relative dimension. They uh, are based upon the browser settings and based upon whether they're zoomed in or zoomed out or, or user preference. The percent uh, element is just what it sounds like. So if you said 50%, it would fill up half of the available space for that tag. 25% would fill up 25% of the available space. The EM tag represents one EM represents the width of one capital M in the current font, whatever that happens to be. Why EM? Well, e, uh, the letter M is usually the widest character in most fonts, so that that lets us say, well, the, that's the uh, widest letter, so we can position things based upon that. There's also a dimension, the EX dimension, and the lowercase letter X is usually the character of the average width of a, of a font. If we're dealing with a monospaced font, EM and EX would be the same. But for most proportional fonts, EM and EX could be very different measurements. And we just put a number in front of EM or a number in front of EX to say how many EMs or how many EXs do we want to use. Okay, we have seen in previous presentations the ID selector, the tag selector, and the class selector. But let's start getting into some more complex selectors within our style. The first complex selector I'd like to show you is the descendant selector. And in the descendant selector, you put a selector, a space, and another selector. And that basically tells CSS Find all of the first and then find all of the second within the first. So find all of the first and then find all of the second within the first. So the descendant selector. Descendants. Um, for example, I have here some class and then an A. So it would find all of the tags that are of the class some class. 
and then it would find all of the anchors within all of the tags that are subclass and select those. So you can see how handy the descendant selector is going to be to let you combine selectors and pick out the specific descendants without having to give every element a class or every element an ID. A couple of additional new styles that I want to introduce very quickly are the height and width style where we can say height and a dimension, either in pixels or EMs or percents or EXs or whatever. And we could also give an element a width. So an H1 or a paragraph or something of that sort, we can just give it a width and it'll automatically be narrow on the page. Um, we can give it a height and, and make it and stretch it or move it around. Um, for many phrasing elements, like um, EM and um, site and some of those, you can't just easily change the height and width because they're all dependent upon the text that's in them, how big they are. Um, there is a way to add the display uh, style to change them to display block or display inline block to change a flow element to look more, or a, a phrasing element to look more like a flow element, and we'll talk about that in a future slide. In fact, here we go. So we can also add a display style to an element, which will change the way an element dis, uh, displays. Um, by default, a phrasing element will display inline and a flow element displays as blocks across the page. But we can tell through CSS, no, you might be a, a flow element, but I want you to display inline like a phrasing element. So I can say display colon inline and it would work inline. We can change uh, an inline element to display block. And then there's this weird inline block, inline dash block, that we can def define the style. And that lets you give a phrasing element uh, height and width, but it still kind of displays inline with the rest of the world, uh, with the rest of its text, which makes it kind of cool when you're styling and moving things around. And then the last display, if you say display colon none semicolon, the element is on the page, but it won't display on the page. Um, it would become a kind of a hidden element. It's there. If you look at the, at the HTML code, it's still there. The search engines still see it, read it, but it's not visible on the page. And we're going to see examples in, in uh, future chapters of where you might want to do that. So let's look at an example style sheet using all of these techniques that we've talked about so far. Um, the HTML you'll see on the next page, but let's just go through the style. Um, the first is header div. So find the div, which is a generic block level element in the header. So find the, all of the divs in the header. There's only one, but find the div in the header. Um, set its width to 68%. And then say, well, Instead of displaying all the way across the page, instead of displaying like a block, display in line. So move yourself up to be more of a phrasing type element, but still have width and height. And then set your background color to a, a pale blue. Um, the next line, the next uh, says, okay, find the nav, which is another block level, another fra uh, fra uh, the flow level element. Um, find the nav and set its width to thirty percent. Okay, and then set its background color to uh, to this uh, whatever this color is. Um, but you can then see by making the both inline blocks instead of them appearing one after the other, they now move to side to side, and because the widths are less than a hundred percent. You can't do exactly 100 because if you do, then the little spacing between them uh, will, will throw them. So that's why I did 68 and 30. And you can now see they move up next to each other. Um, and then um, 
The other thing I do is I change the A's within the nav. So find all of the navs on the page and change all of the A's from being in line to being blocked. Boom, boom, boom. So you can see how they now, instead of being in line, would be blocked. So if you look at the HTML page without style, you would see a header, you'd see a bar with the, you, you would see the header nav, then you would see the header div or the, you'd see the header div, I'm sorry, then you'd see the header nav with its links running across. And this kind of, kind of, uh, um, oh, it ju just made it look cool. Let's go look at the HTML behind it. And again, here you can see the HTML with the header, um, with the div, and with the nav, and then just a paragraph in the body, just to keep it simple. But you can see how we included the units width, um, the units width CSS up with the link up top, and that's why it displayed the way it did. This concludes our video. Um, on chapter, our first video on chapter six. Remember, this presentation is copyright 2020 by me, James Imrano, PhD. All rights are reserved. You can contact me at jim at renejm.com if you have any questions or comments or if you see any errors. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial share alike 4.0 international license. And I'd like to say thank you for watching.